Thanks, everybody. So you can hear me. That's great. So thanks for joining us for the session. Um, so really, today's session is really about you know, putting a spotlight on a couple of our customers um, who, who I think are doing some pretty interesting things uh, on the machine learning side of things you know, with our platform. Um, and so you know, through that lens, we'll talk about some of the you know, common things I think we see customers running into uh, and how our platform you know, helps you know, solve for that um, and you know, sort of you know, go from there. So let's uh, you know, sort of kick this off. So the first customer we're really going to talk about is um, you know, Quantium. So you know, for those of you who might not have heard the name, you know, they're a data analytics firm based in Australia. And uh, you know, I think they're you know, probably one of the largest, if not the largest, data analytics firm in Australia. And I think you know, they actually run, I think, the largest big data cluster you know, in that part of the world. Um, so they're, you know, they've been around for a number of years, and they really sort of take an interdisciplinary approach to sort of you know, the whole advanced analytics space, which is you know, quite in line with what people do. Right? So they've got uh, actuaries, they've got data scientists, they've got consultants and software engineers, a very interdisciplinary mix they bring to their customers. And really, they provide a variety of analytic services to their customers uh, who are across a variety of different verticals, right? so retail, telecommunications, financial services, uh, you know, high tech, so on and so forth. Um, and you know, they've sort of really take a approach of they're going to take proprietary data, so they take their customers' data sets plus third-party data sets and provide a variety of analytic services you know, back to them. Right? Uh, as you can see, they've got some big-name customers you know, in sort of the banking space, uh, insurance, et cetera. So how are they really um, you know, you know, taking advantage of big data infrastructure? What kind of services do they provide? Right? So their sort of whole hypothesis really is really to use personalization as the lever to help untangle relationships between customers and their products, right? So some of the things they do for their customers are, from a business use case perspective, reasonably you know, straightforward, right? So they're looking to help their retail customers, for example, improve their NPS scores, right? Or help improve a loyalty program, um, or you know, help you know, a, uh, a sort of traditional upsell, cross-sell, right? Um, so the question is really, how do they do this, right? So they recognized you know, a few years back that they really needed to power a different and really invest in a different type of platform and paradigm and infrastructure to power these advanced analytic solutions for their customers, right? Um, so they're really, from a big data stack perspective, they've really, uh, you know, standardized, if you will, on sort of MapR as their sort of big data platform. They use, uh, you know, Spark on top of that. And then from a machine learning perspective, they use, you know, tools like, you know, H2O, they use TensorFlow, uh, you know, and, and some other tools as well. And if you think about this from a scale perspective, uh, you know, just some anecdotal data points here, they you know, process something in the order of 20 trillion records, right? And then they take sort of, you know, from a, a, a machine learning model building perspective to build you know, a credible model, they sample that to about 400 million records, right? Um, and since they provide services to their customers, you know, I think what we uncovered from them is on average, uh, you know, every combination that they have to evaluate, that model passes through like, Five million end you know, end user customers like you and me, um, which results in about you know fifteen billion combinations that they have to process, uh, and down to about you know four and a half million customer product combinations per second. Right. So by any you know stretch of imagination, you know, that's some pretty you know big numbers in terms of the scale at which you know they operate. Hence, consequently, if you look at they've got you know um, you know five thousand CPU cores, five petabytes of storage. Um, and 50 terabytes of memory, and you know, some of this data is a little old, by the way, right? So this is, these, these numbers keep going up. Um, and you know, that's how they sort of really power the types of solutions they provide to their customers, right? Um, now, the, the one thing I was gonna you know, say was on sort of, and I covered it in the next slide, is one of their key objectives you know, from a machine learning perspective was reducing both the age of you know, the, the, the scoring you know, from, a, from a model building perspective, um, previously, their prior environment and prior solution and they were, the way they were doing it was they could only have the ability to calibrate their models every six to 12 months, right? Um, and from a data perspective, the data age would be anywhere from one to six weeks, right? So their customers you know, came back to them and said, hey, we actually need you guys to take this you know, much, we, we need you to shorten the gap, if you will, right? Um, so what they've been able to do with our platform and, you know, with obviously the machine learning tools they deploy on top of this is take both the um, age of the models as well as age of the data that the models are running on to be closer to zero so that they can start to deliver real-time analytics, you know, as close to near, near real-time 
and real time can have you know, lots of connotations, right, depending on how you define it. Um, but they're sort of really going to that paradigm of if they're providing you know, their insurance customers with a service on the analytics side, you know, and end consumers can get real time you know, pricing optimization, right? Um, if they're working with a financial services lender, they want sort of instant approval of those loans, right? Um, and then, you know, if they're working with a, a sort of a customer that's looking to optimize their website, they're looking to do sort of more continuous, you know, website optimization, right? So these are the types of sort of cutting edge, you know, use cases that Quantium is really powering for their customers with, uh, you know, our platform is sort of the underpinning of that. Um, and I think, you know, this is just an interesting slide that I think, you know, we, as working with them, we were sort of able to sort of uncover as, you know, they've sort of painted the shift over a 10-year, you know, time period in terms of the way they used to run things in 20, 2006 versus 2016, right? Where in 2006, they were limited to, hey, we're going to work off of a very you know, finite you know, set of data. Um, the, the way they, you know, their customers interacted with their end consumers was very sort of planned and deliberate, right? Um, and then, you know, they had long lead times for things on the media planning side, right? All that has sort of changed, you know, if you forward to 10 years where there's much more data available, obviously, right? And there's much, you know, there's much more ad hoc, you know, customer contacts for a variety of different channels, right? Uh, so these are some of the, you know, what I call classical business drivers that have led, Qu you know, Quantium to rethink their data architecture fundamentally. Um, so the next use case we're going to talk about is uh, you know another you know big customer of ours which is United Health Group. Um, so United Health Group is uh, you know pretty large you know healthcare you know insurance provider, um, and they you know their sort of advanced research and analytics group they run a variety of different use cases on our platform by the way. So the one I'm talking about here is really around fraud analytics, um, and so you know their advanced research and analytics group is is charged with figuring out, really from a business perspective, the business use cases, how can they prevent processing of fraudulent claims and reduce you know, fraud, waste, and abuse that occurs in the, in the payout of those claims, right? Uh, and I think, you know, in fact, USG has gone on record saying that they've been able to save something like you know, $175 million or something in that order uh, you know, by, by really actually you know, applying uh, advanced analytics to this problem. So in terms of, the specifics, you know, of you know, some of the specifics of how they do this, um, they really, you know, have a batch job that you know, does sort of, you know, processing of about 30 million claim records, you know, a week. Um, these models are then deployed, you know, the, the machine learning models are deployed into a spark stimming application, a little bit more of a custom application that is used to flag these claims for human review. And, you know, we don't have enough detail on sort of the scale of that, you know, streaming application. Um, and, you know, we, we're always sort of working to work with our customers to get, you know, the sort of granular details of their use case. And then from a model perspective, machine on the model building side, they really sort of use you know, Spark ML Lib and uh, Torch ML, you know, to, to build these models, right? Uh, they use, you know, the Pojo library for doing the scoring, and they're, you know, pretty big fans of that because it really helps them, uh, you know, help, uh, you know, deploy the models and from a deployment perspective as Java objects and, you know, hand it over to their, you know, uh, technology team that helps, uh, you know, actually, you know, put these into production. So what does this look like, right? So for some of you in the room, you know, who are, you know, either on the data engineering side or on the data science side, this should be a pretty, uh, you know, familiar sort of paradigm to you, right, in terms of the different pipeline phases that, you know, you go through, right? Typically where the technology team is doing a lot of the initial ingestion and data prep, you know, required. Uh, now, you know, not to say that, you know, as uh, on the data science side, you don't do some of that prep, but, you know, if there's common things that can be done, Typically, there's a technology team that probably handles that, right? And in this case, that, that's how they work. Um, the data science team does some initial discovery on deciding what's relevant for them. So, you know, they use, um, you know, Spark SQL and Hive for some of the basic querying, and then they use uh, RStudio and SAS for, you know, some more deeper analytics that they do. Um, you know, the, the sort of tech team then sort of passes de some, you know, denormalization of data, you know, other data treatment things and passes over to the data science team, which is then doing the classical, they're going to train the model, build it, score it, and sort of redeploy it. Um, these are then sort of handed back over to the technology team where they sort of deploy these models into the streaming application, uh, you know, that I talked about. And then on the reporting side to sort of wrap it up, and this is, uh, you know, it might be a little bit of an anomaly where sometimes the reporting happens up front, but in this case, they actually, the data science team is using reporting to actually do reconciliation of some of the models they've run and, you know, kind of go back and ensure that uh, it is what it is and it makes sense. 
Uh, and then the reporting is also used for you know, you know, providing uh, you know, visibility back into sort of management, right? Um, so that's the way they sort of you know, have their uh, you know, different phases of their pipeline broken out. Um, so you know, this is sort of a schematic that you know, helps just, I think, paint a picture of you know, what it looks like, right? So our sort of converged data platform is you know, at, the, uh, at the underpinning of this, right? Um, and then you know, there are different tools used depending on, I talked a little bit about that, on sort of the data engineering side with data prep and ingestion and you know, on the data science side for some of the basic you know, discovery. And then uh, you know, tools like you know, RStudio come into play for the more uh, you know, advanced things they're doing. So I think with sort of both these customers, you know, one of the common themes we see is, um, at least from our, you know, I won't have you know, enough time to talk about you know, our features you know, of our platform at a broad level. You definitely stop by our booth for, for more information on that. But I think we see a couple of things, some couple of common you know, themes here, right? Um, in terms of you know, how we're able to enable these customers to really you know, help scale their machine learning deployments. So I think, A, you know, we've got a couple of features uh, you know, that I'll talk about quickly here. First is a concept called volumes. So think of volumes really, really as a logical way to help organize and manage data that's in your cluster, right? So you as a data scientist, uh, so think of it as you know, a simple way to really uh, you know, have a, your own directory structure, if you will, for managing the data that you want to access. We can have specific permissions to that. Uh, there's a bunch of other things that also come along with it. So you can get your own volume, right, with the right level of you know, security privileges assigned to you, and then that can also help sort of you know, help a little bit in sort of the job scheduling aspect. Snapshots, on the other hand, are, you know, as you might think about it, snapshots is sort of a concept uh, you know, from the storage you know, side of things. Uh, and you know, we've got you know, pretty robust you know, storage offering that we have. Um, so really, snapshots are used for really um, going back to a specific point in time and seeing what the exact data was at that point in time, right? Um, and the way we think about snapshots is you know, they are sort of atomic and consistent from our perspective, which means the application has exactly the view of data at the time the snapshot was taken. So why is this interesting for machine learning, right? It means that you, your machine learning framework of choice, you can use snapshots to enable sort of a reproducible and auditable model training process. So as you're going about training your model against the data set that makes sense, you can take that model, right, point it back to a variety of different snapshots and you know, help you know, train that model in a more seamless fashion. And both of these customers, as well as other customers, you know, they continuously keep coming back and telling us that, hey, from your platform, these are two of the capabilities that we really you know, take advantage of in a big way, right? And these capabilities are you know, unique to our platform, so you won't find these really in other you know, alternative you know, big data platforms out there. Um, and the last is really sort of the, our you know, random read-write uh, you know, file system. So MapR is a fully, from a storage perspective, we provide a fully read-write POSIX compliant file system, which means that if you've got specialized libraries in C or C++ or any other language, you can get them to work out of the box, right? Uh, you can use sort of modeling language of choice and get access to data in the cluster. Um, so really, I think if we were to sort of, sort of sum it up, I think on the modeling side, there's you know, a set of, uh, you know, uh, choices and a set of things that you know, people struggle with, you know, uh, or are dealing with, right? Shouldn't say struggle with. I think as a data scientist, you're looking sort of a safe environment to play in, right? You want to use the language of your choice, right? It could be Python, Scala, etc. Um, you want to use different libraries, right? You want to potentially reuse, you know, some things that have been done on the data prep or data ingestion side, um, and then you want, you know, some reusable uh, models, you know, so there's a lot of innovation happening in the machine learning, you know, world where there's some specialized libraries you want to take advantage of, right? Um, then on the production side, if you sort of, you know, switch over to this, there is really, you know, a set of things here in terms of where do you have enough of the hardware, you know, to help sort of, you know, scale the application, right? Uh, how easy is it to put these models into production? Um, you know, what are the sort of, you know, different libraries and configuration files that you need to have in order to take these, you know, things into production, right? Uh, and we believe, you know, our platform helps, you know, solve for both the, the sides of this equation, both on the modeling side as well as, you know, on the production side. Um, so, you know, with that, I'm pretty near my time. I want to point you to just a couple of things. You know, we recently announced also on the deep learning side a uh, distributed deep learning solution that takes advantage of our platform. You can use, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes as sort of your orchestration layer. You can also use, you know, Docker uh, in that context and then deploy, um, you know, a, uh, you know, TensorFlow, uh, you know, solution on top of that as, you know, probably a broad architecture. So there's a link, um, you know, to a blog there. So check that out. 
And on the course of Spark side, we recently you know, announced uh, integration between our NoSQL database and Spark that really helped sort of read and write to using Spark RDDs from our uh, NoSQL database. So with that, I'm out of time, so I'll uh, pause, and you know, thanks for your attention today. <laughs>